Hi, thank you for joining my presentation. Today I'll be talking about how we pre-trained neural network encoders on 100,000 microscopy images and it led to better segmentation and microscopy quantification. My name is Joshua Stuckner. I'm a materials informatics scientist at NASA Glenn Research Center in sunny Cleveland. Uh, my collaborators are Brian Harder, Tim Smith, and Steve Arnold. And this is funded by Transformational Tools and Technology, which is part of the aeronautics uh, side of NASA. Uh, so the way we make a material affects the properties of the material, where properties are a function of the processing. But recently, with advances in materials informatics and data-driven tools, we're able to flip this around and design fit-for-purpose materials, where we start with the properties and solve this optimization problem and find the processing steps that will give us the most information about hitting that target property. And we do this with starting with the data, and we need quantitative, quantified data to do this, and then some sort of machine learning model. This is the new thing that is enabling this inverse design, uh, where we have a machine learning model that approximates this function f of x, which establishes the processing uh, property relationships. And then we have some optimizer, and then we can uh, solve for the optimal processing step that's going to get us to the next generation material uh, with fewer experiments. So you may have noticed that we're actually missing something here, and that would be the microstructure of the material. Because how we make the material has a massive impact on the microstructure of the material, which in turn has a massive impact on the properties. So this is just a generic phase diagram. It could be steel or, or something else, and this could be carbon. And just small changes in the processing uh, chemistry have a massive change on the microstructure that's generated, which in turn is going to have a large impact on the properties. So we really need to capture the full PSP uh, relationships in order to build these models and do inverse design. And we need quantified features for all of these in order to fit into our models. Now it's easy to quantify uh, processing. We heat it to 1,000 degrees. That's the number of properties. Maybe it's 1,000 megapascals ultimate tensile strength. But the structure is a little bit more difficult to quantify. Um, so when we look at a microstructure, we might say, oh, okay, it has some pores here. Maybe these are lattice planes on a TEM image. And if we're an expert, we might be able to predict what type of properties this material might have. But to the computer, it's just an array of numbers. And it's way too high dimensional to fit into these machine learning models as is. So we need to quantify this microstructure. But how do we do that? Traditionally, we might have used manual uh, measurements, uh, maybe with hand measurements or software assisted with programs like ImageJ. And we just go about one by one measuring, um, making the measurements, or maybe grain size with ASDM standards. Uh, but this is extremely tedious and time consuming, and there's a lot of potential for bias, where one researcher might think it's the orange line here, and another researcher thinks it's the, the yellow line. And so it's not very repeatable. Uh, but automatic quantification has become uh, quite popular in the last decade or two, and there are a couple different ways to do this. I'm going to talk about two. Uh, one is recipe-based, where we prescribe some computer vision algorithms that are going to extract the features. Uh, for example, we might segment the image with O2's method, uh, do skeletonization to find the center of the backbone, and a maybe a distance map with a distance transform, and then multiply them together to get this radius map here, which gives you the radius measurement at every single pixel along the backbone here. But these can be a little bit tedious to create. You need an expert to create them. Uh, and maybe they're not robust for, uh, if you have vastly changed the imaging conditions. Um, and then newer approaches are using purely data-driven techniques where we use neural networks and just input the image and then get uh, quantified uh, feature vectors out the other end. So our technique can actually improve both the segmentation step and the data-driven step. And the segmentation step is often the, it's the first and often hardest part of uh, recipe-based microscopy segmentation. Um, so convolutional neural networks are the state of the art in uh, image analysis, image quantification. Uh, vision transformers are catching on in a big way in the computer science world and may soon be entering the material science world. Um, but for now, we're gonna discuss convolutional neural networks. But this technique would work for uh, vision transformers as well. Um, so uh, these neural networks, uh, image neural networks, are made out of two parts. Uh, an encoder, which will take the image and then produce some feature vector at the end after doing all these convolutional um, things. And then some sort of task-specific head, such as a classifier or perhaps a segmentation network or a regression um, head in order to predict properties. And uh, this requires a lot of training data in order to learn the filters in order to extract good features. So what they do in the current state of the art is 
pre-train these encoders on a data set called ImageNet, which is millions of images of everyday life, of cats, dogs, and it, they tell the model to predict, okay, this is a dog, this is a cat. So you feed it the input-output pairs of dogs and cats, and the model learns filters here in order to make good predictions with the classifier. So it learns a good feature representation here. It, it learns filters to produce a good feature representation that can then be used to predict uh, the class. So. And this, this type of data is pretty cheap compared to segmentation data. So what we can do is take this pre-trained encoder, almost like a Lego brick. These models, have, they have different pieces that are very, very interchangeable. So we can take this encoder Lego brick, if you will, which already knows a lot about image analysis, and stick it into a segmentation model, like an encoder-decoder network such as UNET, for example. Um, and the filters that it's learned here will transfer well to microscopy segmentation. In the earlier filters, it learns things like corners, edges, that's in microscopy images. Then in the intermediate layers, you might get things like texture um, or patterns or things like that. And then in the deeper layers, you start to have like cat ear detectors or dog tail detectors. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a, a cat in my microscopy image. And if I ever did, I would know that I've been at the lab too long that day. So we had the same intuition that maybe those cat tail detectors wouldn't transfer so well to uh, microscopy segmentation. And so we pre-trained encoders on 100,000 microscopy images that we had at NASA and that we found online and in the literature. And we're able to um, predict different materials and then apply it through transfer learning into these encoders. And now the high level filters were things like twin boundaries or, or grains or precipitates. So we have a microscopy aware encoder that can be used through transfer learning and other types of data sets. And we can use less training data for segmentation. And this is extremely expensive uh, training data because we need to take our input uh, images and generate the output. So we, some researcher needs to actually draw the segmentation map of this and then feed it several examples. So if we can make this uh, use less of this training data because it's expensive and use more of this training data, which is cheaper, um, then we can get much better results Like because we can have more training data. Um, now, our training set, Micronet, had 54 classes. It was 100,000 images. Our validation set had 2,700 images, 50 per class. Uh, we used pretty standard augmentation, uh, which ImageNet is trained on, um, like flipping, resizing, random contrast, Gaussian noise. One difference between ImageNet and the way we did augmentation was we did vertical flipping. Typically, they don't do that in ImageNet because you don't really see upside down cats that often. Um, but in microscopy, they can be flipped upside down and it, it doesn't really matter. It's just the way you put it in the microscope often. Um, and we use pretty standard uh, training. All the details are in the paper and very similar to how it's done for ImageNet. Um, and then we trained all these encoders, uh, some of the older encoders like VGG, some of the newer ones like ResNet, and then the really new ones like ResNext or Inception. Um, so we tested out all these different encoders uh, and pre-trained them on Micronet. Now the dark blue here is when we pre-train just on Micronet from randomly initialized encoders. And then the light blue is when we actually started with pre-trained ImageNet models and then fine-tuned them on Micronet. Um, that way, maybe there are, it can start from stuff that it's learned from the pictures of everyday life, and then if it needs to fine-tune some of those high-level features, it could. And the classification, the top one accuracy, is reported here, uh, usually between like 85 and close to 95%. Some of the classes were extremely similar, so it confused those a little bit. For, for the most part, uh, very highly accurate. It's a little bit interesting to look at the differences about, like Densent, for example, did better with pre-training from scratch on Micronet, whereas the efficient model Models, which were highly parameterized, uh, hyperparameter uh, tuned to do well on ImageNet, uh, required uh, ImageNet pre-training in order to get uh, highly accurate results. I speak of that a little bit more in the paper. Um, but what we really care about is the segmentation accuracy because you don't typically care about uh, classifying a microscopy image. Like if you were going to put a material in a microscope and spend all that money and time, you probably already know what it is. But what we really care about is what have these encoders learned? Have they learned good representations that can then transfer to other tasks like segmentation or property prediction that we do care about? So we tested um, on two different data sets. This is a nickel-based superalloy, and this is an environmental barrier coating with a thermally grown oxide here. And we did seven experiments. Um, Six of them were with reducing the number of training data uh, for our segmentation. And then one of them was for um, a completely different test set. So the test set was completely different. So we wanted to see how robust 
was the models at uh, outer distribution data, which is pretty common in microscopy images. There have been several times where a researcher or might give me some microscopy images and say, um, hey, develop a solution for this. I, I develop an image analysis solution. And then a week later, they say, hey, here's some more very similar images, but they're completely different. Um, so having out of, uh, models that are robust to outer distribution data can be extremely helpful. It makes the models more repeatable and more general, uh, more shareable between research groups. We pre-trained it on uh, many different encoders, the cross product of all the encoder and decoders. We used UNET, very, very common, UNET++, which is a, a new implementation of that that kind of combines like features of DenseNet. Um, and it ended up being like thousands of models that we trained. It took months on our four GPUs that we have. And the accuracy metric we used was intersection over union, which is a pretty common uh, segmentation accuracy metric. Um, and so here are the results for the environmental barrier coding. This was the training data or, or three of the images from the training set and here's the test set. And uh, you'll see here that these test images match up with these uh, segmentation maps here. And what you wanna see is black and white. Those are the true positive and true negative. And you don't wanna see blue or pink, which is the false positive and false negative. When we have 18 training sets, we get pretty accurate results. You could do size analysis on this. Uh, you're, you're getting the oxide layer out. And it was pretty equal on both ImageNet and Micronet. When we go down to four images, we have a slight, re uh, in the training set, we have a slight reduction of accuracy, um, but that's to be expected. And it's not bad. You can, even for both of them, you can do pretty well. And that's pretty good. Even pre-training on ImageNet, um, it has pretty good microscopy segmentation results. If you're not doing any pre-training, you should at least be doing um, uh, ImageNet pre-training. Now, when we go down to just one uh, image in the training set, which was this image outlined here in orange, and notice that this image is quite different from some of these other ones, especially that far one, um, we get we we have we do have a large reduction of accuracy, and that's to be expected. But Micronet does a lot better, a 6% increase in accuracy. And yeah, it's down to 66%, but that difference um, between 60 and 66 in this case is the difference between being able to do analysis on it. This we would not have been able to do uh, measure that oxide thickness because we have so many false positives down here. But over here with the Micronet pre-training, we would have been able to do uh, microscopy analysis with it. So we see very good uh, results with even just one data on the training set. Pre-training on Micronet uh, leads to a greatly increased um, accuracy with reduced training data. Now, this data set is the nickel-based super alloy, and we get even better results. This is almost astonishing, really. I was surprised. So when we have 10 training images, we, do, we get pretty good results. Uh, when we go down to four training images, the ImageNet data really starts to reduce. And the, uh, but the Micronet data like stays pretty good. And then with only one training image, this one right here, uh, we're able to segment with Micronet uh, very, very well. We have hardly any reduction in accuracy, what, 96 to 93. And uh, over here, we're all the way down to 74% accuracy. Um, and these test images lines up with this one here. And you can see we can, we're getting all the tertiary precipitates. Uh, here we're getting all the tertiary, even though the contrast is a lot different, because the Micronet model has learned that you know microscopy images can be different contrasts, and it's still the same thing. Um, uh, but for ImageNet uh, pre-training encoder, which is the one uh, training image, uh, we're losing all the tertiary precipitates here. We're over-segmenting. Uh, they are, it's going to think of them as all one big blob, so we're not going to be able to do the analysis on that size measurements, whereas here, we can do size analysis. We can see the tertiary precipitates. Um, so even with just one training image, uh, pre-training on Micronet leads to greatly increased results. So for the last experiment, we tested way out of distribution data. Maybe different etchants were used uh, in the case of this one. Uh, in different sample par parameters, we have uh, different um, imaging conditions. This is a completely different alloy, uh, still a super alloy, the Nicobet super alloy. And uh, we look at the results. So ImageNet, 72%, whereas Micronet gives us a 78% accuracy, a, a quite a significant jump, uh, especially since these are so different from our training sets, um, the fact that we're still getting pretty good results is, is frankly astonishing. Um, we're here, uh, we get none of the tertiary precipitates, but here we're getting the tertiary precipitates. Again, that's gonna think that these are all one big blob, whereas here we can do size measurements. So this is usable down here, um, whereas this is maybe not so usable, like you don't get any of the tertiary precipitates. Uh, so pre-training on Micronet in this case made a huge difference on out-of-distribution data, which makes the model more useful for uh, sharing between research groups and more general. Um, in the worst case, you maybe have to sketch out another uh, piece of training data, uh, whereas this one you might have to sketch out several 
or more pieces of training data for out of distribution. But often I notice that it just works without me having to retrain the model with new training data. Uh, so for example, uh, these are several different environmental barrier coatings, and they look quite different. So what we want to do is segment this oxide layer, but we're also going to segment the cracks in this case. And yeah, these are all very, very different types of images. But the segmentation is incredibly accurate um, when we're pre-trained on Micronet. Uh, so for here, for example, like it gets that this is not part of the oxide layer, that little uh, gray piece there. This one, I actually had to go to the researcher and say, hey, how do I even label this? It, uh, where does the oxide layer even start? Uh, and once I did label it, I was able to get that. Oh, and by the way, none of these were in the training set, the validation set, or the test set, or anything. These are completely new images that um, I was asked to uh, analyze, and I was like, oh, yeah, I don't think that one, or this one, or uh, this one's going to work, because they, I haven't really seen anything like that or trained with them like that. But it, it, uh, I was surprised that it ended up just working um, without having to add any more training data. And then we're able to do things like size analysis, um, measure the oxide thickness, the thermally grown oxide. Um, we can measure the crack spacing. We can measure the roughness, and um, we were thinking that the roughness may, uh, if it's rougher, it may grow slower. Um, and if we can find ways to control that, then we may be able to um, reduce the thermally grown oxide. So we're trying to establish the structure property relationships so that we can find levers that we can control to get the material that we want. Um, or we could hook up these quantified features into full inverse design or active learning type data-driven approaches to find optimal um, processing conditions to give us fit for purpose materials. We've applied this to a bunch of different types of alloys. This uh, Nikolay super alloy, uh, you can L718, an additively manufactured copper alloy. We're able to do good segmentation and extract tons of features. Um, the morphology statistics of the, of the precipitates, the aspect ratio, the size, volume fraction, the spacing between the precipitates, uh, whatever the, the scientist thinks is a good feature to um, relate to the processing and properties. And we're able to get very um, so many measurements that we can get accurate um, distributions of those. Because often, it's the extremes in the distributions of the features that are going to give you your failure, like a weakest link type scenario. So it's the extreme statistics that you really got to look out for and quantify. Um, and we're able to do this with automatic quantification in a way that would be difficult with manual quantification. So this work shows that pre-training on Micronet models leads to uh, better segmentation results. And our early analysis has shown that it's better at uh, using directly for property prediction or other techniques. Um, so since we have a better feature representation using our microscopy aware encoder, it could be used in other previous techniques as well, um, such as uh, Pratt and Whitney has been doing with Ryan Norris to directly predict properties. Um, they could use this encoder to maybe get better property predictions. Um, these guys in Belgium at AUKUS and Ghent University will take that feature vector and do PCA maybe, dimensionality reduction, link, hook it up to PSP models um, using Gaussian processes or random forces, and then they can do inverse design and discovery or sequential learning. Um, so they might get better results using these encoders. You could even take the entire um, hypercolumn vector like uh, they do at Carnegie Mellon University with Elizabeth Holmes and Brian DeCoste. So we've created a general microstructure aware pre-trained encoder that has able to produce higher accuracy on segmentation data with less training data. It's more robust to changes in imaging and sample conditions. Um, we've tested several different architectures, uh, encoder architectures. The newer ones end up working better, such as Squeeze and Excite, ResNex, Inceptions, um, and UNet++ was consistently the best decoder. Um, but our code actually makes it super easy to test all the different encoders that you want. Um, one thing I want to mention is that there's a major need for a large microscopy data set. Um, and benchmarks so that we can evaluate different methods with, say, segmentation or regression benchmark data sets. Or if we had a bigger micronet, then we can train even better encoders like um, ImageNet. In the computer science natural image world, they're pre-training on hundreds of millions of images where we only have like, 100,000 that I put together was the largest that I've ever seen. Um, and so if we could have a large public data set, we could really improve the field a lot. So all the code is available here. You can uh, check it out. You can download the pre-trained encoders. Um, you could, if you're using ImageNet pre-training already, then it's only a line or two of code in order to use the Micronet uh, pre-trained encoders. The preprints of the paper is here. If you'd be willing to share images with us, then you can put them here. If you mark them as confidential, then I won't share them with anyone. Uh, we'll keep them internal. But what we can do is use them to uh, pre-train even better encoders, and we'll put that uh, back on the repo. Uh, this code, 
I'm trying to make it as usable as possible and support it as much as possible. If you run into any issues, you can probably find my email online or just leave an issue on the repo and I will uh, get back to you on that. Um, so thank you all very much. I appreciate your uh, interest in my presentation.